So now that we have defined the computational problems 1A and 1B, let us go ahead and solve it. And uh, this will be the outline for the rest of the session. We will be looking at uh, the solution to problem 1A first and then to 1B and finally we will look at how these two can be combined together and applied to the EAST network. So the source of these problems or solutions are from uh, this particular work by Scott, Heidecker, Karp and Sharon. Uh, so this is uh, the conference version was from 2005, Recom 2005 conference and then the journal version for, is from 2006, efficient algorithms for detecting signaling pathways in protein interaction networks. So the same computational problems that we defined, that we have just defined, right. And the reason that we wanted to choose this work to be highlighted as the very first uh, real world uh, problem, right, is, is because this is a important problem that has stood the test of time award. This particular problems and solutions have stood the test of time award in Recom 2017. So 12 years after the original paper was published in 2005, uh, this publication have had the greatest impact on subsequent research, okay. So it is worth knowing about this uh, problem and worth knowing about this algorithm. And, uh, and also uh, it is worth knowing about it because of the very natural way in which it combines a machine learning solution or a machine learning algorithm with a graph algorithm, okay. So th that is what I like about this work and that is what I wanted to convey uh, in this session, okay. Uh, so naturally because this work is based on this set of papers, uh, the journal paper as well as the conference version and there was also a, a Recom 2005 presentation slides. So the material uh, the in terms of figures or slides that follow are based on the material in the above papers and also on the presentation made by the above authors uh, of their Recom work, okay. So thanks to them for, uh, for, uh, for these materials. Yeah. Okay, so let us recall the computational problem 1A and we are going to look at the solution to this. We want an ML approach to estimate the probability that protein U interacts with protein V, okay. So that is the problem. So how do you uh, predict this probability? We need some input features. Like I said, the number of times the interaction between U and V is experimentally observed could be one feature. The other feature could be the similarity of the expression of the corresponding two genes that code for these proteins U and V, right. And the similarity of expression could be for instance computed using Pearson correlation coefficient, right. And uh, this is uh, another place where you would have seen in your foundations of statistics course some of the different ways in which correlation can be computed between two variables and Pearson correlation is one standard way to figure out if two variables are correlated or not, right. So if you look at uh, gene, gene U that codes for protein U and gene V which codes for protein V, in, in a database of uh, yeast microarray experiments, they looked at whether these genes are correlated or not. So if they are correlated, if they have some kind of relation like this, then they have high similarity. If they are not correlated, some other genes, gene U prime and coding uh, another gene coding another protein B prime, maybe they are not correlated, they may look like this. So then this is a high correlation, this is a low correlation. So then you will say that proteins U and V that are based on this high correlation between the gene expression GU and GV, then you will assign larger evidence for proteins, you will assign higher probability for proteins U and V to interact, okay. So on the other hand for U prime and V prime, your weight will be low, okay. But for U and V you want your weight to be high because the corresponding genes are co-regulated together and then that may suggest that the proteins U and V are also always around and then so there is more likelihood for them to interact, okay. So that is the second point, right. The first point is very intuitive, more number of experiments you observe this particular pair of proteins to interact, the more probability you want to assign to this pair of proteins to interact. The second point is the more similar the expression of the corresponding genes are, the more probability you want to assign to this pair of proteins to interact. Third one is something that looks at the neighborhood of these two proteins. You look at this U protein, you look at all the neighbors of this U protein and then you look at the V protein, you look at all the neighbors of the V protein and then you look at how many of these neighbors are in common, shared neighbors.
if the neighborhood of u and v are larger then it is more likely that the protein u will interact with protein v ok. So, that is the premise of the third feature. So, and that is uh, captured using something called small world clustering coefficient that is essentially high if the neighborhood of u and the neighborhood of v in the observed protein protein network is large they are they, they have a lot of overlaps. If they have very few overlap if you have a u prime and a v prime where only like one or two overlap right. So, one or two uh, neighbors overlap, but all the other neighbors do not overlap. Then, then u prime and v prime will have lesser support for their probability uh, I mean for, for interacting ok. So, then their probability should be set lower. So, these are the three features that they use the authors used in their work and given these three features right, given these three features then you can apply different uh, machine learning models to estimate this probability right. So, these machine learning models are binary classification models given a pair of proteins you want to predict whether it is in the positive class interaction class or negative class non interaction class that they do not interact right. And so, the authors chose the simplest model that worked for them given the amount of data available and at that time given uh, which model worked for them logistic regression worked well for them and so they, they went ahead and used it ok. So, this is a lesson that we may also take for current studies I mean currently there are many deep learning models and logistic regression is one of the simplest shallow learning model right. Uh, currently there are many deep learning models and if you have enough adequate data you can also try some of these deep learning models to do binary classification. But then in the absence of uh, very large data sets and uh, and in the presence of some uh, some some simple target accuracy that you want right you may start with simpler models before you go to more sophisticated models okay that is something that you will realize in real world problems is you you may want to start with simpler models as a baseline to figure out if uh, if your accuracy is sufficient before you try more sophisticated models okay so more formally a logistic regression uh, you would know this from your uh, prior machine learning techniques course, but let us just uh, do it more formally. So, more formally a logistic regression for every pair of proteins you can have a variable y u v a random variable which will be 1 if u interacts with v and 0 otherwise ok. This is the positive class or the negative class and then for every pair of proteins you also have 3 features x u v 1, x u v 2 and x u v 3 right and these are the 3 features that comes from um, this number of experimental studies in which it is observed, the Pearson correlation coefficient of the corresponding genes and finally, the small world clustering coefficient right, the shared neighbors among these two proteins u and v. So, then the logistic function is something that takes these three real numbers x u v 1, x u v 2 and x u v 3 this vector x u v of three real numbers and converts it into a number between 0 and 1 right through this logistic function and you have seen this before. Uh, so, I will keep it very brief. So, this function will essentially on the x axis you have this beta naught plus sum over i equal to 1 to 3 beta i x i u v right. And if it is 0 then you can see here that this is going to be 1 right and so 1 over 1 plus 1 is going to be 0 0.5. So, this is going to be 0 0.5, this is going to be 1. So, this is your logistic function right which is your p of y u v equal to 1 given x u v and your parameters beta right. And your parameters beta 1 is going to be the relative weight you give to the first feature, beta 2 is going to be the relative weight you give to the second feature and beta 3 is going to be the relative weightage you want to give to the third feature right. And all of that are combined together in this linear fashion and that is going to be this sum over i equal to 1 to 3 beta i x u v i and beta naught is your intercept term right intercept parameter and then your logistic function will take basically take this and then you do a 1 over 1 plus e to the minus of this argument right. And that converts something that this this is a real number right this is a real value real number and it converts this real number from minus infinity to plus infinity right into a number between 0 and 1 
right. So, this is this is going to be like this, right. So, this is your logistic function and essentially this is all we need, this is the estimated probability, right. So, the probability that uh, y u v equal to 1 is basically probability that u and v interact given your set of features x u v and given some set of parameters beta, okay. Like I said beta 1, beta 2, beta 3 are the relative weightage of the three features and beta naught is an intercept. You need to figure out what these values of these parameters are to finalize the logistic function. So, a training set is needed, we need a training set of positive and negative examples. The positive examples are going to be uh, a set of protein pairs that are known to truly interact in yeast, okay, and this comes from a database called MIPS. The negative examples are often hard to come by in bioinformatics or biology, so we usually resort to taking random pairs of proteins, okay. So, the negative examples are going to be random protein pairs, and we will just simply assume that uh, these random pairs of proteins will not interact truly in the underlying yeast system, okay. There may be some exceptions to that we may some of these may be noisy. So, so, we may think that this random pair is not interacting it may actually interact, but that is like a, a, a limitation or a caveat that uh, we would not be able to truly say whether two proteins do not interact, okay. So, we will have to rely on random protein pairs as negative examples. So, once you have these positive and negative examples then you can use this training data set to figure out the best value for these betas, okay. And you would remember again on how would you figure out this best value of beta that fits the training data set the best. You just have a loss function and you want to minimize the loss function, okay. That is what is shown in the next slide. So, you have a training objective function is you are going to have a cross entropy loss and you are going to minimize this cross entropy loss. What is a cross entropy loss? The cross entropy loss is some form of distance between your predicted distribution. Let us call your, uh, let us call this P u v as your probability of your true interaction y u v equal to 1 given your input features x u v and some set of parameters beta naught, beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, right. So, p u v is a function of beta uh, and for every u v it is going to tell you what is the estimated probability, right. And so, it is going to change if you change beta this is going to change, but for a fixed set of uh, parameters beta then p u v comma 1 minus p u v is your predicted distribution, right. And what is the actual distribution that is y u v comma 1 minus y u v, right. So, for positive examples y u v is 1, so it will be 1 comma 0, for negative examples it will be 0 comma 1, right. So, that will be your actual distribution. So, now you want this predicted distribution to be as close to the actual distribution as possible, right and the distance between those two distributions can be calculated using this cross entropy loss. It just takes y u v and multiplies it with minus ln p u v and then it takes 1 minus y u v and multiplies with minus ln logarithm natural logarithm of 1 minus p u v, okay. So, this in some sense tells you the distance or loss between the predicted and actual distribution. Now, you want to minimize this loss, right, across all the data sets uh, or all the training data points. So, here you are summing over all of your u v in training data set, okay. So, that will give you a loss that is dependent on beta because uh, different values of beta will give you different loss and then you want to find out the best value of beta that will minimize this loss and that is what is shown here you want to be able to come up with the beta hat, the value of beta naught, beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, right, the relative weightings of the different features that will minimize this cross entropy loss. And uh, you can figure it out using gradient descent or other iterative optimization procedures, you can figure out what the beta hat is. And once you have the beta hat, then you can apply it to any test data, right, any, any new protein pair that comes in and we can just predict what is the probability that protein U will interact with protein B, okay. So, one question to ask here is why did you use a specific cross entropy loss function, why not some other loss function, why this particular form of lawns and lawn of 1 minus p u v's and so on, right. And you may recall from your earlier ML techniques course that cross entropy loss, minimizing cross entropy loss is equivalent to maximizing the likelihood um, of or the probability of generating the data given a particular model specified by the parameters beta, okay. I will leave it at that and uh, let you recall the details of how this is motivated by a maximum likelihood approach, this cross entropy loss, okay. Like I said before, 
now that you have figured out what is the best value of beta uh, based on the training data set, then for any pair of proteins u comma v, you can predict this probability p u v by just uh, replacing this beta naught with beta naught hat, beta i with beta i hat, okay, your estimated betas from the training data. So, now once you have this, then for every u comma v, you can set the edge weights to be w of u comma v equal to log of this above probability for that particular u comma v. So, those u comma v pairs which have more number of experimental observations, then beta 1 let us say is higher, then those will get better probabilities and those with which are observed in lesser number of experiments on, or those whose genes have poor expression similarities, they will have lower probabilities estimated. Okay. So, that completes our solution to problem 1a. Okay.